Chapter 9. Mr. T was about to say, I ain't getting on no airplane, when the doorbell rang. The church lady from across the street often stopped by to invite Henry over for midweek worshiping, but when I opened the door, it wasn't her. Robert. Hey, Ongs. What's up? What do you do when you're out of the blue? Mom shuffled down the hall practically in tears and hugged him. Then Robert turned and looked at Joe and me, eyes broader and stranger than I remembered. I fought back a bashful smile. Something was different. He seemed more, how do I say, more Mexican. After a six-month stint in youth authority and another stint in prison, he'd been living out in the Central Valley, along with the Trollos and Lowratters of that era. A coterie of bizarre characters existed in his imagination. His favorite was a hypnotist con man from the confluence of magic carpet rides and shady flea market deals gone awry named Sneaky Gypsy. Robert would tort his hands together. His pupils swole like an owl's. Sneaky Gypsy's gonna swindle us blind if we don't look out, he'd say. Then he'd sneak up on Joe from behind and grab a hold of his head like he was performing some bizarre exorcism. Ah, you big head bastard, he'd say in this strangely endearing Smokey De Bear voice. Next thing he knew, he was doing Wolfman Jack impersonations. What's going on out in Stockton? I asked him. I was living out there with this dude named Jinx. That dude's an SSI case like me, eh? So check this out. He shoots speed while tripping on acid at the same time. You never seen anyone like this disturbed wetto. The dude has no fucking teeth, and he still stays up mumbling about shit. What's prison like? Joe asked. Don't ever end up there, and that's what it's like. Oh, yeah. I saw Manson escorted by the guards one day. Did he try to cut your head off with a machete? Nah, but he's still an ugly motherfucker from across the courtyard, even. He was heading to the commissary. He had people giving him money left and right. They think he's a fucking god. Hey, he ain't no god. Just another disturbed individual like everybody else up in there. You ever get into a prison brawl? Only on the outskirts. You got the Nostra Familia. You got the Norteños. We're the mortal enemies of the Sereños. There's MS-13, man. They go crazy for heavy metal music. Then you got the Aryan Brotherhood, the Blacks. Oh, and Tukey Williams on death row. The Blacks always talk about Tukey. Tukey? This sounds like a cartoon character to me. Cartoonishly buffed, Holmes. One of the baddest dudes in our whole system. A week later, I heard rapid tapping on the window at 2 a.m. Hey, Gene and Joe, I just stole a car. We climbed inside of this colossal white clunker. Not a true lowrider like a 64 Impala or a 52 Mercury, but it was close enough to give us the sensation that we were cruising like Vakthos. Joe and I dressed just like Robert by this time. Flannel shirts underscored by clean white to white feeders, pleated beige khakis, and blue paisley bandanas pulled love to the eyes. Robert had some old these on the radio. I got homeboys out near King and Story Road in San Jose, Dakota Road and Hayward. Robert pulled into a parking lot on Alcatraz and Shattuck while the traffic lights flashed yellow and red, piercing the otherwise desolate night. A police car floated past. Shit, that's six up. You think he saw us? Nah, I don't think so. But we shouldn't assume he won't come right back. Robert started up the engine. The officer pulled the cruiser into the parking lot, headlights off, bumpers almost touching. Robert eyed the cop through the rearview mirror. The red-blue lights of his patrol car suddenly popped on. The fright I felt lasted about 10 seconds before the cop inexplicably but purposefully peeled out of the parking lot and sped down Alcatraz Avenue. The silhouette of the rock contrasted with the lights in the foreground. Robert immediately squealed out of the parking lot and dropped his off at home. Over the following weeks, Robert taught us some invaluable skills. Joe and I watched from across the street of Alcatel Liquors. A white guy wearing a thick black trench coat walked down. Robert ran up to him. He reached into his pocket and pulled out Mom's Hitchcocky and butcher knife. Give me your shit, he demanded. The frightened guy put his beer down on the sidewalk, then threw a handful of change to the ground. What a fucking mark, Robert said while we gathered up the loose change and cord of Budweiser. The three of us made our way up Telegraph with great enthusiasm, laughing hysterically up a look on the guy's face. Alongside the Smokehouse Barbecue Restaurant, we saw the flash twinkle, rare flash twinkle blue. A black female officer stepped out of her car. Hey, you three, 
Come here. The cop handcuffed us and placed us into the back seat. She then drove us down to the mini mart. The guy in the trench coat was sitting at a bus stop there. Are these the ones? She asked the guide. When the guide peered through the back window, Robert flashed his mad dog look back at him. No, that's not them, the victim told the officer. Flustered, the cop drove us back down the block and released us. We figured that if we kept committing felonies, all we needed to do was mad dog the accusers. Chale, Robert said. Now we don't have any more pisto. One day, Robert came by high. I just smoked some Sherm Holmes. What? You smoke Sherlock Holmes? Joe said. Nah, Sherm. Formaldehyde dipped cigarettes with weed. PCP. I feels like a furry munchkin on this shit. Robert took his munchkin self mixed store where the neighbor had occasional musical jams. Two hours later, Robert stumbled out with bloodshot eyeballs. This dude was just telling me we should go to Berkeley tomorrow and score some acid. You mean that hippy dippy shit? Don't it make you see little green men? LSD was measurably weaker than the stuff from the 60s, but it could still get hippos to slide up telephone poles. Or hippies. They still dropped acid and slid up telephone poles with surprising regularity in the early 1980s. The stuff was so potent, cheap, and plentiful, blotters would float down like hits of psychedelic confetti and settle right from the tips of our tongues. But stand too long on Durant and Telegraph, and you're just as likely to have someone's warm pee rain down from a rooftop, so you had to be careful. We acquired our first doses in plain view right in front of the Bank of America branch. The hits were $2 or three for $5. Somebody told me they took acid and freaked out, I said to Robert. That dude got some bad shit, eh? With good shit, you just keep cracking up, Holmes. Even Jinx likes it. You think this shit's fake? Joe wondered. Nah, this ain't body burns acid. It'll creep up like a fucking jungle cat. 30 minutes later, we were stampeding down College Avenue with wild buffalo energy. During the come up, I was catapulted from the mundane to a world of utter astonishment. By waving my hands before my face, trails or tracers danced across my visual field. Mundane everyday objects took on a striking presence. The sidewalk became captivating with undulating waves of depth and complexity. Everything melted and reformed again, like surrealistic painter Salvador Dali's well-known composition of melty objects, the persistence of memory. Cars had eyeball headlights and smiling grills and exuded sentience. They seemed to be smiling at their good fortune at being a car. Tires rolling on the pavement echoed multiple layers of light noise. Doppler effects circled and swirled about, musical notes rendered as translucid jelly. I felt my skull pushing out to make room for expansion. There was plenty of room for that to happen. Joe had a peculiar tick, holding his right hand up near his shoulder and rubbing his fingers around in circles, like 